<laughs> awesome. Okay, slide two, the pattern of the tabernacle. So we're looking at the pattern of the tabernacle and we've got the three main compartments, the outer court, the holy place and the holy of holies. And looking to the right, that would be east. Um, there's the entrance gate. And when we enter into the outer court, we've got the altar of burnt offerings followed by the laver. And then this part is covered. Um, we couldn't see in if we were flying over it from above. That's the tent of meeting. The outer chamber is called the holy place. And then the holy place and the most holy place or the holy of holies are separated here by a veil. So in the holy place to the north, we've got the table of showbread. That was with the 12 loaves for the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, to the south, we have the lampstand made of pure gold, one piece of pure gold, seven branches, seven lights. Remember, we learned that the number 22 was there, 22 bowls. It had 66 total decorations and really an amazing piece of work. So tonight, our focus is the altar of incense. So we're going to be talking about two altars. We've got the altar of burnt offerings on the outside, and we have the altar of incense here. And then again, this is the veil that separates those two chambers and in the Holy of Holies, which was a cube, 10 cubits by 10 cubits by 10 cubits. We have the Ark of the Covenant and we have the mercy seat. So that's the pattern of the tabernacle. And even though things change a little bit as the permanent temples are built, that basic fundamental pattern doesn't change. And that's true for the heavenly temple as well. So as we've been talking about the tabernacle, we've been looking at two aspects of the tabernacle, how each piece of furniture represents the work of Christ. So Jesus said, I am the gate. I am the way. No one comes to the Father except through me. We know that he is the Lamb of God who gave his life for the world. So he is the offering for sin. Um, also, he is the living water that cleanses us. And all of that symbolism is there in the labyrinth. This is just a really quick summary. As we move into the holy place on the north side um, with our table of showbread, Jesus said, I am the manna that came down from heaven. I am the bread of life. And then opposite that, we have the lampstand. And Jesus said in his own words, I am the light of the world. So all of those things there are wrapped up in the work of Jesus. Tonight, our focus is going to be the altar of incense. And we're going to be learning about intercession and prayer. And Jesus is the ultimate high priest who makes intercession for us. As we pass through the veil, going from the holy place to the most holy place, even the veil is representative of the work of Christ. Hebrews chapter 10 tells us that the veil is his flesh. And we know that as he was on the cross, as his flesh was torn, the veil was also torn. So there's that um, symbolism there. Finally, the Ark of the Covenant, which contained a copy of the Ten Commandments. Um, and then on top of that is the mercy seat, which represents the very throne of God. And it was on the mercy seat that the blood of the day of atonement was placed between God and the law making atonement for us. So everything in the tabernacle is indicative of the work of Christ and everything that he provides is something that we need. So another aspect of our interpretation to the tabernacle was understanding that God has provided the way for us to approach him because we know that the fellowship was lost in the garden because of sin. And God said, build the tabernacle so that I may dwell among them. And so how is he going to accomplish that? He's going to take care of the problem of sin, which only he can take care of. So every piece of furniture represents the work of Christ but also it represents our approach to him. So in this diagram, we're looking at the outer court as the justification of the sinner. We are justified by his blood and we are cleansed by his word and by the Holy Spirit. 
When we look at the holy place, this is representative of the process of sanctification. We feast on the word, we're filled with the spirit, and we engage in prayer for ourselves and intercessory prayer for others. So this is the process in our lives called sanctification. Pressing on through the veil into the most holy place. Well, this part hasn't happened yet. This part is called glorification or perfection. It's that moment when we finally... We're, we're raptured away or we're resurrected from the dead and we're taken into heaven in our new bodies. That's the glorification or the perfection of the believer. And that's when the believer is in the presence of God. And we're going to see allusions to that with the altar of incense and the elders. So that's kind of where we've been and what we've been studying. Any questions or comments so far? Okay. I can't see y'all and I can't hear y'all and it's a whole different experience. I feed a lot off of the expressions on your faces. So we will go ahead and get started with our focus tonight, which is the altar of incense. So we're going to begin um, in Exodus 30. And I sure hope somebody still has their microphone on because I'm going to ask somebody to read. Oh, I can hear somebody's pages turning. Exodus 30. I need a volunteer reader for verses 1 through 10. Who's up to it? Let's see. I will. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you, Stacy. You shall make an altar to burn incense on you. You shall make it of acacia wood. I'll do it if you want. A cubit shall be its length and a cubit its width. It shall be square and two cubits shall be its height. Its horn shall be of one piece with it. And you shall overlay its top, its sides all around and its horns with pure gold. And you shall make for it a molding of gold all around. Two gold rings you shall make for it under the molding on both its sides. You shall place them on its two sides and they will be holders for the poles which to bear it. You shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put it before the veil that is before the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony where I will meet you. Aaron shall burn on it sweet incense every morning when he tends the lamps. He shall burn incense on it. And when Aaron lights the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense on it. A perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. You shall not offer strange incense on it or a burnt offering or a grain offering, nor shall you pour a drink offering on it. And Aaron shall make atonement upon its horns once a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonement. Once a year, he shall make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy to the Lord. Okay, thank you so much for reading, Stacy. I appreciate that. Let me get back to the... Okay, so as always, we want to make sure that we understand the description. Um, so let's go back and look at the details, kind of from the beginning of the passage. What kind of wood was this altar made from? Acacia. Acacia, right. Acacia wood, some translation you may say shatim wood. That's the acacia wood. And we talked about how it's connected with um, having thorns on that tree. This is what the altar of, of burnt offering was made from. This is what the table of showbread was made from of course, covered with other materials. This altar was covered with gold. Remember the altar in the outer court was covered with bronze. Now, um, we were given its dimensions. Anybody have their microphone on? How big was it? A square, a cubit long, a cubit wide and two high. You got it. A cubit by a cubit by cubit two cubits. 
And so it's square on top, just like the altar of burnt offering was square on top. This is quite a bit smaller than the altar of burnt offering. So two, two cubits high and one by one on top. Um, again, it's a little smaller than the burnt offering, but still square on top. Just like the altar of burnt offering, the table of showbread, it was to be transported through the gold rings that were attached to its sides with the staves or the poles um, inserted into those rings and carried on the shoulders of the priesthood. Now, we were looking at the map earlier. It was to be placed in the holy place just before the veil this, that separated the holy place from the most holy place. Now, this was an important detail. When was Aaron supposed to burn incense on it? All the time. All the time. Specifically, at the same time that he was to tend to the lampstand. Remember, he had to tend to the lamps in the morning and in the evening. And also, he was to burn incense in the morning and in the evening for perpetual generations. So it was another daily task that he had to tend to while he was in the holy place. So remember, we compared Aaron tending to the lamps to Jesus tending to the lampstands in heaven or being in their midst. And we're going to see the same thing here. Just as Aaron had to go in and burn the incense every morning and every evening, we're going to look at Jesus as our intercessor and in the connection between incense and prayer. No burnt offering was given on this altar. That was reserved for the altar of burnt offering in the outer court. But Occasionally, blood was placed on the horns. Remember, at the top of the altar of incense, on the four corners, there were four horns, just like there were four horns on the altar of burnt offering. Occasionally, uh, specifically on the Day of Atonement, blood would have been placed on those horns um, during that very special ceremony. But it was reserved for the incense. So that's the description of the altar of incense itself. Now let's read about the sacred incense. So we're going to drop down to verses 34 through 38. So chapter 30 verses 34 through 38. Anyone out there want to read? I'll read it. Okay, go for it. Can you hear me? Yes. Then the Lord said to Moses, take fragrant spices, gum, resin, anchia, and galbanum, and pure frankincense, all in equal amounts, and make a fragrant blend of incense, the work of a perfumery. It is to be salted and pure and sacred. Grind some of it to powder and place it in front of the testimony in the tent of meeting where I will meet with you. It shall be most holy to you. Do not make any incense with this formula for yourselves. Consider it holy to the Lord. Whoever makes it, makes any like it to enjoy its fragrance must be cut off from his people. So just like God instructed Moses to build everything in the tabernacle exactly according to the pattern, and they didn't have the freedom of artistic interpretation, the same thing is true with the sacred incense. It had to be made according to this specific formula with the four specific spices that Cindy read. And they couldn't just bring in any old incense that they thought, oh, this smells good. I kind of feel like, you know, French vanilla today, right? They had to bring in this specific formula every single time and offer that morning and evening on the altar of incense. Now, when this was burned, it was fragrant. It smelled like perfume. It was a sweet and pleasing aroma to God. Now, remember that because we're going to be comparing incense to prayer. Now, if someone were to copy this formula and make that incense and use it in their own home as opposed to offering it in the tabernacle, um, what was the penalty for that? Can you pick up on that? Sure. Very last verse, verse 30. They would be cut off from their people. 
Yes, they would be cut off from their people. So it was very serious. This was sacred. Right. This was sacred. It was set apart and it was holy and reserved for use in the tabernacle only. Now, we skipped a little bit in that chapter, but before we read about the sacred incense in chapter 30, it also describes the holy anointing oil. It had a different formula with four different spices. Um, and it was used for anointing the tabernacle and dedicating it, but it was also specific to the tabernacle. It couldn't be used for any other purpose. So these things are holy and set apart and very special to God. So now that we've seen a description of the altar of incense, and we've learned a little bit about the sacred incense, which by the way, in Israel, um, there is a farm which is not far from the Dead Sea, and they're looking at growing these ancient plants in the desert and producing all of these special spices so that they can make the holy anointing oil and so that they can make the fragrant incense. Um, and so they're actually cult cultivating this for use in the third temple. And the formula is very specific and very holy. So let's see what the Bible has to say about incense. So we're moving on to the section called the sweet incense of prayer. The Bible equates the burning of sweet incense with the offering of prayer. Just as the altar of incense was in the holy place, shielded from the observation of outsiders, remember it was in the covered tent, prayers offered secretly from the believer to the father rise before him as a fragrant and pleasing aroma. If you want to jot this down, Matthew 6, 6 talks about praying in secret, going into your closet where no one knows where you are and praying just between you and the Father. The Father rewards that secret prayer. But specifically looking at interpreting the incense as prayer, which will help us to understand some things in Revelation, Psalm 141, 2 says, let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense. So in that verse, we have prayer and incense together. Revelation 4, 8 <clears throat> says, And the four beasts, each of them had six wings about him, were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night. Uh-oh, did I get the wrong one on there? Um... Oh, I'm sorry. It's supposed to be Revelation 5.8. I copied the wrong one onto the slide. Revelation 5.8 is on your notes. It says, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. So your notes are correct. My um, slide is incorrect. Revelation 5.8, the 24 elders have golden bowls full of incense which are the prayers of the saints. So notice how the Bible interprets um, the incense. The incense is the prayers of the saints. Um, remembering that the altar of incense was in the holy place, um, just near the veil, on the other side of the veil, we have the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. The mercy seat, again, is an earthly shadow of the heavenly throne of God, and thank goodness his throne is called the mercy seat. But the altar of incense was very close to the veil, and just on the other side was the presence of God. So if we understand that the incense on the altar of incense represents prayer, then we should understand that when we are in prayer, we are as close to God as we possibly can be while we're on the earth. Eventually, we'll have the opportunity to pass through that veil, through the rapture or through resurrection. But now when we pray, we are very, very close to God because our prayers are lifted up before him as incense. So think about that. Aaron was supposed to burn the incense regularly before the Lord for generations to come. He offered it every single morning, consistently every day, even on the Sabbath. And if the incense represents our prayers, then the question is, do you start your day with prayer? Do you end your day with prayer? Not that you have to be religious about it, but that discipline is good, right? having a set time to pray in the morning and the evening, and then also every time in between. Because in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, Paul says, pray without ceasing, right? 
Um, but that quiet secret prayer between you and God in the morning and the evening is very sweet and it's a pleasing aroma to God. And James 5, 16 says, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And so prayer is a really important part of the sanctification of the believer or the maturing of the believer. Um, the instructions about the incense, remember, it said that this was sacred incense and it was to be used only upon the altar of incense in the tabernacle before the veil, before the throne of God. And that incense was not to be used for any other purpose. So that also instructs us that our prayers go to God through the Son by the Holy Spirit, and they should not go any other place, right? Those that pray to other gods are offering incense in a place that's not the tabernacle, and the penalty, remember, was being cut off from your people. Um, so we can even see that shadow there. And, you know, today the emphasis on meditation techniques and emptying your mind and meditating on things that are not of the Bible or of the Word of God, that's a, a very dangerous and, and slippery slope. How are we doing so far? Questions? Comments? No? You're doing good. Everybody can hear okay and yes, all that good stuff? All right. Hey, Shannon, it's Alan and Tamala. Just had one question that we wrote down. So when the incense on the one side of the veil and the ark on the other side of the veil, mm -hmm. does the incense waft through the veil to the ark and the holy of holies, like our prayers? I don't know, but I, I do know the veil was very, very thick. And when it was torn in two from top to bottom, the rabbis just marveled because they thought that was impossible. So it, it is possible that the incense seeps through the veil, but I don't know. What I do know is that on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would take coals from the burnt offering altar and they would he would combine it with the incense from the altar of incense and actually carry it through the veil into the most holy place and burn the incense there. And that's what we see happening in the book of Revelation. Did anyone have any other thoughts on that or a better answer? The veil was made of of um, woven wool and fine thick wool, right? Mm -hmm. Colored wool, and so the incense probably did permeate it. And if you think of the veil as Jesus, mm -hmm. and the incense kind of became part of it, part of Jesus. That's interesting because we do pray in the name of Jesus and you're kind of describing the incense going through the veil as our prayer is going through Jesus, the intercessor. That, that's a really, really good observation. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, let, let's talk about our intercessor, our great high priest. We see a picture of the responsibilities of Jesus today as we look at the description of Aaron in the Old Testament. It was the responsibility of Aaron, the high priest, to tend to the menorah and to the burning of incense every day. We saw how Jesus walking amongst the lampstands in Revelation chapter 1 um, he is also tending to the altar of incense. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, Romans 8.26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth us in our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So this is saying that the Spirit helps us to pray and goes so far as to make intercession for us. And we know that our prayer is like the incense. Romans 8.34, who is he that condemneth? Is It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God and who also maketh intercession for us. 
So Jesus who died and rose again is now in the heavenly temple as the great high priest making intercession for us. And remember, prayer is a picture of intercession or the incense is a picture of intercession. And the best one, Hebrews 7.25, wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for him. He ever liveth to make intercession for them. Oh, another typo. Sorry about that. Got that verse twice. But Jesus, he is the great high priest in this uh, verse and it says he ever liveth to make intercession for us so just as Aaron the high priest tended to the altar of incense daily offering that sweet and pleasing aroma to God the spirit helps us to pray and Jesus himself is in the heavenly temple ever living to make intercession for us that's a very very comforting thing so we can also see a connection between prayer and incense from a story in the New Testament. So if y'all will turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 1, we're going to get some good info out of this little story. Luke chapter 1, and we're going to read about Zechariah, who was the father of John the Baptist, and his duties in the temple. Anyone out there want to read verses 5 through 16? Get back to the meeting over here. Read. I can read. Okay, thanks, Tamla. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both advanced in years. Um, and how far do I go? Verse 16. To 16. Okay. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. Okay, well, thanks for reading. So we're going to skip from Old Testament to New Testament, and then eventually get to the book of Revelation, and it's all tied together. So Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, he was a priest. He was a descendant of Aaron, and his wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. And it says in uh, verse 5 of Luke chapter 1 that Zechariah was serving in the course of Abijah. So what that means in the course of Abijah, if we go back to 1 Chronicles 24, King David organized the priesthood into 24 courses. There was priests, there were singers, and there were gatekeepers. And so Zechariah was serving in his rotation, you could see, you could say. And remember, we studied that pretty extensively when we were looking at the feast days as harvest days or harvesting of souls for the resurrection and the rapture. Zechariah was actually um, serving in that living, functioning 24-course priesthood. 
And this particular day, he was chosen to offer the incense on the altar. So he goes into the holy place and he begins to offer the incense. Now, what did you notice? What were the people doing while he went in to burn the incense? They were praying. Praying. They were praying, right? So Zechariah is inside offering the incense and all the people on the outside were praying. So there's another connection between the incense and the prayer. And so much to his surprise, while Zechariah is in there burning the sacred incense, an angel appears at the right side of the altar of incense. And that angel is the angel Gabriel. Gabriel always brings special announcements um, often related to to Jesus. And Gabriel speaks to Zechariah. First thing he tells him to do is fear not. But then what does he say just after that? In verse 13, after he says, fear not, what? Your prayers, Your prayers have been heard. Your prayers have been heard. Isn't that interesting? So while he's burning the incense and the people are praying outside, this magnificent angel Gabriel says, your prayers have been heard. And of course, his prayers had to consist of, you know, wanting a son. He was old, Elizabeth was old, but those prayers had probably been offered for a long time. And he was also in there offering the incense and praying for the people as part of his duty as one of the priests. So definitely there is a connection between the prayer and the burning of incense. Now, the better we know all of that, the better we can understand the heavenly temple and even the events of, of the book of Revelation. And here's where it gets really good and juicy, and I, and I love studying this. <clears throat> but the tabernacle is simply an earthly shadow of the magnificent and true heavenly temple. The earthly tabernacle was very, very simple and rustic and quite small and portable and humble, but it is a shadow of the greatest place in all of the universe, which is the heavenly temple and the dwelling place of God. And so when we study this very simple tabernacle, it really is loaded with symbolism, but it's teaching us about something that's absolutely magnificent. And we hear more clues about this in the book of Revelation. So in the same way that King David ordered the Levitical priesthood into 24 courses, we can identify the 24 elders in Revelation 4 and 5 as the heavenly priesthood. Uh, because believers are identified as kings and priests in Revelation 1, 6, John says he has made us kings and priests. And remember, the elders are dressed in white. They have crowns on their head and bowls of incense. They are kings and priests. Remember, they're on thrones. And 1 Peter 2.9 says that we are a royal priesthood, that's a kingly priesthood, we can conclude that the presence of the 24 elders in the throne room of God indicate that believers have been taken within the veil in the first rapture to take their place in the rotation of the 24 courses in heaven. So that's really, really exciting. Like the duties of the earthly priests included offering incense, this is exactly what the 24 elders are doing in heaven. Now, that number 24 is symbolic. There are 24 courses in um, the priesthood, but each course had many, many servants in that course. So there's not just 24 priests alone, but 24 courses, and they are headed by these 24 elders. Here's Revelation 5 8. It says, And we, when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having each one of them harps and golden vials full of odors or incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And remember, when we studied the, the priesthood, we also learned that they had very special harps. The Queen of Sheba brought King Solomon these almug trees, which no one can really identify because that's the only time it happens in the Bible. But King Solomon turned them into harps and gave them to the priests and they would use them to prophesy. So it's amazing that the 24 elders in the heavenly temple have harps and they sing a new song. And 
Solomon taught there's nothing new under the sun, but in the book of Revelation, there is something new. It's the new song of the elders. It's the new song of the 144,000. It's the song that those that stand on the sea of glass sing. They're singing a new song, new in all of creation because they have been redeemed. They have been resurrected and raptured and they're in this heavenly temple and they're participating in the priesthood in the service of the heavenly temple. So I get really excited about that stuff. I love it. So let's examine the altar of incense in the heavenly temple a little bit closer. If you'll remember, we studied the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement was the 10th day of the seventh month. Remember, the first day of the seventh month is the Feast of Trumpets. And then 10 days later, we have the very solemn and serious day called the Day of Atonement. On the Day of Atonement, the very first duty of the high priest was to bring much incense within the veil to offer above the mercy seat. So every day the high priest burnt the incense on the altar of incense morning and evening. But on this one special day, he would carry the incense through the veil into the most holy place. And he was required to burn much incense there in Leviticus 16 which is describing the Old Testament Day of Atonement. It says, and he, the high priest, shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord. And where would he find burning coals but on the altar of burnt offering, right? So he would take coals from the altar of burnt offering and he would take his censer full of burning coals and hands full of sweet incense beaten small with that special sacred formula and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat. That's the, the picture of the throne of God. The incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not, right? It was a serious business. So the very first thing before he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, he would offer much incense going through the veil, carrying it in through the veil and offering it before the mercy seat. When we understand that the prayers of the saints are the incense and the mercy seat is in the holy place and the priest has passed through the veil into the holy place, then this is exactly what the 24 elders are uh, doing in the heavenly temple. Whoops, I think I got out of order here. That's what I was trying to go back to this one. So the 24 elders in the heavenly throne room before the throne of God, that's the holy of holies. That is the holy of holies. They have golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Now, no sacrifices were to be offered on the altar of incense. Those were to be given on the brazen altar out in the outer court, but blood atonement was placed on the four horns of the golden altar once per year on the day of atonement. That was like the second step of the day of atonement. So down here first in Leviticus 16, that describes the day of atonement. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord. So he's, he's offered the incense. He's sprinkled the blood of the bull and the goat on the mercy seat seven times each. Then he goes out unto the altar that is before the Lord. This one is the altar of incense and make an atonement for it. And he shall take the blood of the bull and the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. Remember the golden altar of incense had four horns. He would take the blood and he would put it on the four horns of the altar of incense. Up here in Leviticus chapter four, it's describing the, the sin offering. And the same thing is true. He takes the blood and he puts it upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense. So if we pay attention to those details, when we get into uh, the heavenly temple, an interesting thing happens, but we can understand it through those Old Testament types and shadows. Those earthly procedures are just a shadow of the heavenly procedures. In Revelation 9, it says, and the sixth angel sounded. So this is the sixth trumpet angel. And I heard a voice 
from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. Okay, so there you go. We've identified the altar of incense in the heavenly temple. How do we know that this is the altar of incense as opposed to the brazen altar? Because it says the golden altar, right? The altar of incense was covered with gold in the holy place, but in the outer court, the altar of burnt offering was covered with bronze. It was known as the brazen altar. So this particular verse identifies the golden altar before God, and this is in the heavenly temple. So there's the altar of incense, right? Saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for a day, an hour, and a month, and a year for to slay the third part of men. So the, the, the voice is coming from the four horns of the golden altar. And remember, blood was placed on the four horns in the Old Testament altar of incense. The Bible tells us that the blood was given to us to make atonement, that the life of the creature is in the blood. As Tamla pointed out in class not too long ago, she was mentioning the scriptures that say Abel's blood cries out from the ground. So blood cries out. And here we have this voice coming from the horns of the golden altar crying out. And what is it crying out in response to? Well, remember in Revelation 6, the martyrs are crying out, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you avenge our blood and judge the inhabitants of the earth. Well, here, the sixth angel is going to sound its trumpet, and there is going to be um, a war, right, to slay the third part of men. So it's in response to the prayers of the saints, and it's the voice coming from the four horns of the golden altar. How are we doing? Is that making sense? <laughs> Does that make incense? <laughs> <laughs> Is it making incense? I love it. I love it. Okay, y'all chime right in if you have any questions. <clears throat> so the point is the earthly tabernacle is a shadow of the heavenly tavern, the heavenly temple, the true temple that is the dwelling place of God and his throne. And when we understand the pattern of the earthly temple, it really helps us to understand some of the events in Revelation, not only knowing the, the furniture of the tabernacle, but also in combination with the feast days that we studied. We're going to hear themes of the Day of Atonement in the book of Revelation. And so when we have that Old Testament knowledge, we are richer in our understanding of not only the work of Jesus and our approach to him, but events which are shortly going to come to pass in the heavenly temple. So let's finish our lesson with this last topic, distinguishing between the two altars in heaven. Now, for a while, I was unsure, is there really a, an altar of burnt offering in heaven? And can we distinguish between the golden altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering? And I think we can, but I'm open for discussion. So I'm going to throw this out there and see what you think about it. Um, the scriptures clearly indicate that there is, in fact, a golden altar of incense in the heavenly temple. Other places in Revelation also refer to the altar, but let's be careful to distinguish between which altar are you talking about? The golden altar of incense, which was in the holy place, or the brazen altar of burnt offering in the outer court. Revelation 8 verses 3 and 4 is interesting because I think it has both altars in this passage. So Revelation 8 and another angel, bless you, was that a sneeze? I think I heard a sneeze. Bless you. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. So the altar that's being talked about, we've got the prayers of the saints, we have incense and we have the golden altar. So we're talking about the golden altar before the throne, the altar of incense. And the smoke of the incense, which came up with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Now, let's see, is it this one? 
I think it might be in the next one. Let's continue. I'll, I'll elaborate as we go. One important aspect of the brazen altar of burnt offering in the earthly tabernacle was that the fire was to be kept burning continually. So remember the altar of burnt offering in the outer court, that's where the burnt offerings were given and the fire was to always be burning on it continuously, never, never going out. This was important because the Bible tells us that the fire from the Lord came down and consumed the sacrifices on the altar of burnt offering when Moses and Aaron first dedicated the tabernacle. So after they followed all the instructions, they built everything exactly according to the pattern. Then the fire of the Lord came down and received their sacrifice. This is in uh, Leviticus 9. Back up in Leviticus 6, that first scripture there says the fire upon the altar, this is the altar of burnt offering, shall be burning and it shall not be put out. So the fire was constantly kindled with wood and burnt offerings upon the brazen altar in the outer court. It should never go out. Okay, so back here, whenever the angel takes the incense and a golden censer, and he offers it, where does he get the fire for that incense, but from the brazen altar, right? Leviticus 9, 24, again, after Moses and Aaron dedicate the temple, says, and there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed upon the altar, the burnt offering and the fat, which all the people saw, and they shouted and fell on their faces. So all the work was finished. The tabernacle was built. The high priest's garments were made. Everything was complete. They anointed it with oil. They anointed Aaron and his sons. They dedicated the temple, the, the tabernacle. And a fire came out from the Lord and received their burnt offering. That fire was sacred because it came from God. This happens again when Solomon builds the permanent temple and he dedicates his temple. Fire comes down from heaven and receives his sacrifice as well. We see with uh, Gideon or, or um, Manoah, Samson's father, he goes out and he makes an offering and the Lord, the angel of the Lord receives his offering by fire. And so the, the act of the fire coming down from heaven and receiving that sacrifice is an expression of approval from God for the work of the tabernacle. So when we think about the believers at Pentecost, with the fire on their head and they were the first fruits of the wheat harvest. That's the fire of God coming down, receiving that living sacrifice and giving approval to it, right? Yet another meaning of the tongues of fire on the disciples' heads. So understanding that the fire always had to keep going on the altar of burnt offering and the incense sacred and it can only be used in the tabernacle. Then when we go back and we look at the incidents of Nadab and Abihu, two of the sons of Aaron, um, we understand why that was uh, such a, a bad thing. Leviticus 10 verses one through two, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. So I take that to mean they used their, their Bic lighter or a match. They didn't get the fire from the altar of burnt offering where God kindled the fire, right? They offered strange fire before the Lord. And because they weren't following his directions exactly, then the fire of the Lord came out and consumed them and they died before the Lord. So even the fire that's on the altar of burnt offering is um, sacred. So I think understanding that the fire comes from the altar of burnt offering or the brazen altar and the incense is offered in the altar of the golden altar of incense, then we can begin to distinguish between the two different altars in heaven. So four examples to identify the altars. And the important words are in bold print there on your notes. <clears throat> Revelation 6. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar, so we need to ask which altar, the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. 
They cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So these souls have been slain, and they have shed their blood for the testimony of Jesus, and they are under the altar. I suspect that that's talking about the altar of burnt offering. We've looked before at the scripture that says after the, uh, sacri the animal was sacrificed and placed on the altar of burnt offering, that the blood was poured out at the base of the altar. Now, I've listened to teachers say these souls are under the altar of incense, and that's still a possibility. But the fact that they are described as being under the altar, they have been slain and their blood has been spilled. It sounds like a bloody sacrifice that's associated with the altar of burnt offering. Revelation 8, 5. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it to the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. So this is the angel in Revelation 8. He takes the censer, which was for uh, burning incense, but he fills it with fire from the altar. The altar of burnt offering had the holy fire that was always continuously burning. So that looks to be the altar of burnt offering. Revelation 14, 18. And another angel came out from the altar. So here is the altar. The question is, which one? Which had power over fire? Do you see that? So... There is an angel which is in charge of the fire of the altar in heaven, just like the priesthood in the earthly tabernacle had to keep the fire on the offer of burnt offering continually burning. They had to kindle it with wood and keep it going. There is an angel in heaven is described as having power over the fire. Um, and then he, he cries with a loud cry and, and, begins to initiate this, this harvest that's described, the, the great harvest. And then finally in Revelation 16, the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters. Now this is, this is bad news. This is when the wrath of God is being poured out at the very end of, of the tribulation. Uh, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord. And look at this. We have an angel in charge of the waters, right? Which art and was and shalt be because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints. Remember the, the martyrs of the fifth seal under the altar were crying out, how long until you avenge our blood? Well, notice during the wrath of God, this angel says, they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another angel out of the altar say, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. So the point of studying the tabernacle is because it is a, an earthly model of something heavenly and magnificent. And especially at understanding the time that we're in, if, if we look around us, we are home from work. Some of us, not everybody. We're home from work. Our kids are out of school. There's a pestilence that's spreading across the entire world. Economies of large and powerful nations are being disrupted. These are the birth pangs that Jesus talked about. And so when we study the tabernacle and we understand its connection to the heavenly temple, then in my opinion, that means that's pretty exciting because we're going to know our way around when we get there, right? We want to, as soon as we get to that heavenly temple and, and we see those things, we're going to know those things because God gave them to us in his amazing word. So if y'all want to turn your microphones back on, and if you have questions or thoughts, or if you want to discuss what in the world is going on with this coronavirus, and how close are we to the priesthood, the royal priesthood being taken into the heavenlies, the heavenly temple, and, and participating in all of those events, that's that's right around the corner. It's it's not far away. It's it's hopeful that's why i like studying the elders in in revelation you guys have any thoughts or things to add 
I, I do. I'm, I'm curious how they carried that lighted fire as they're on their migration across the desert. Mm, that's a good point. And did they keep it burning? Well, it it's, says it had to be. You're right. And, you know, I... You know, and, and I know, you know, in ancient time, the, the people that carried the fire so they could, when the, back in the cavemen days, that that was a, a particular uh, status level, that mm -hmm. it was the fire bearer, but uh, mm -hmm. I just, I, I'm just thinking about the, all the wool and the heat and whoever was trying to carry this, that must have been unbelievable. Yeah, that, I never thought about keeping the fire going. Willow, will you turn your microphone off? Please? Yeah. <laughs> um, I never thought about the fire going while they were traveling, but you're exactly right. What a challenge. Other thoughts? It reminds me of when we have our church service and, and they, um, like at Christmas Eve, and we light the candles from the Christ candle and mm -hmm. goes out into the whole congregation. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful ceremony. Whose puppy is that? <laughs> I love it. So as you're witnessing the things that are happening and, you know, we as a class have been talking about this for a while and we observe the, the earthquakes and tsunamis and the fires and the things that are happening. But this coronavirus is maybe one of the first signs that has reached all the way to Amarillo and to our lives and has disrupted all of our lives in a profound way. And so we're seeing these things come to pass with our eyes. And, and these are the birth pangs. These are the things that happened before the priesthood goes into the temple and, and Jesus takes the scroll and, and opens the seals. But it's exciting. It's scary. And we got to be careful, but it's exciting at the same time because the Bible talked about these very things. Thoughts? Shannon, whenever I was in the Lutheran church, we we always had an eternal uh, lit, a eternally lit candle. And I think that's why. Mm -hmm. Keep the candle going. Yeah. Reminiscent fire of the, the fire on the altar. Yeah. Always being kindled. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. Any other questions or thoughts? Yes. It seems like Jesus came it's and Santa saved us from this pain. You know, maintaining the temple it's just unbelievable. It's unimaginable mm -hmm. to work. And I can't imagine mm -hmm. why they want to build another one. <laughs> <It's our maintenance. laughs> well, there was a an entire tribe that was dedicated to the service of the temple. And so dedicated, in fact, that when the inheritances of the 12 tribes of Israel are described, the Levites did not get any land. They didn't get a plot of land like Judah or Benjamin did. They were given cities and suburbs because they were not to be so tied down to their um, earthly lives. They had to be able to, to leave when their course came up. There's 24 courses. They would serve two courses, two weeks per year, plus the holy weeks in the spring, summer, and fall with the, the harvest. And they had to be able to get free and be able to go do that. So to the extent that their inheritance was not land, but cities. And I was even thinking about that because towards the end of Revelation, the bride of Christ is described as the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven as a city, right? So the priesthood that we're studying as a picture of the, the church which was shadowed by the Levitical priesthood, those priests lived in cities. So isn't it interesting that the bride of Christ is described as a city, beautifully born for her husband, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. Just another piece of evidence that lets us figure out who the, the elders are. The, the elders, the temple, 
the bride, the body, all of those are describing the group of believers in different ways and different aspects. I forgot how we got off on that. The priests live in cities. Oh, the high maintenance, right? But it was their whole focus of their, that tribe was traded for the firstborn so that they could be there to take care of those duties and sing and praise and keep the gates and, and all that good stuff, right? Right. Hi. Hi. Any other thoughts? We can turn our um, microphones on. Comments on over here. Good. I'm glad it 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 feels like um, we're all together. Well, um, I guess I'm still. Let me turn my screen off here. I do appreciate everybody being willing to do this and get together, clumsy as it may be. It's really good to see everybody, and I do want us to pray. Maybe, Tamla, you could pray for us. I'm sorry, I forgot to pray at the beginning. I don't know what I was. Sorry about that. Um, Tamla, maybe you could pray for all of us. I would consider it a privilege. Thank you. Thank you so much for working out all the technical stuff for us to be able to do this tonight. And um, oh, will we do this again next week? I will be glad to do it. And you know what? I will host it for whoever wants to come. Um, so if you'd like to tune in, I'll send out another appointment. I set it as a recurring appointment. So I think it's going to be the same link, but I'm still learning and I'm not sure. So I'll communicate by email. And also, if you can get on the GroupMe app, that's a, a real easy way for us all to talk and stay caught up with each other. So I'll send out an appointment for 630 next Wednesday if you want to come. Great. And if you don't like this format and you'd prefer not to come, I totally understand. Um, but, you know, this is the, the tools we have at the time. So I just feel very thankful. So um, thank you for all the detective work and the computer guru stuff and everything so that we were able to have this lesson tonight. So if you're all ready, then I would be happy to offer a prayer. Let's do it. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we are able to be together tonight. Um, we know that there's no distance in prayer. We know that you hear our prayers, and we thank you that you think they are. Lord, um, we're praying, you know, we're all in different places. We're praying with one spirit tonight. Um, we thank you so much for Shannon for her love for you and for your word and her understanding of it and her ability to communicate it to us. Lord, we pray a hedge of protection around her and her family. And um, everybody who's here tonight, Lord, help us to all be able to meet again next time. And um, thank you so much for your word, Lord. I, I have never felt so privileged and so blessed as these days when we are not able to physically be at church but to have our prayers and our creeds and our music and our um, technology and people who are willing to do the hard part so we can be fed lord we just thank you so much for that i pray for this infrastructure to continue to hold up and we pray for our country lord that people will be obedient and um do whatever we need to do to flatten our curve and to um, we pray for all the people who are ill lord for your healing hand we thank you lord so much for this, for this opportunity that we have to grow closer to you, grow closer to each other, to learn new things, Lord. Um, we thank you for the good 